Hi class, we talked about um, starting vocabulary for geometry last class. So our learning target for today and sort of for this unit is going to be no precise definitions of angle, circle, perpendicular line, parallel line, line segment based on undefined notations of point, line, distance along a line, and the distance around a circular arc. Um, so what we just started doing last class is we started talking about the notation for each of these vocabulary words. And so what we mentioned was whenever you have an angle, an angle will have arrows at the end of it, and an angle is usually made up of two rays, and on the rays you have multiple points. The most important point is the point at the corner. And instead of calling it a corner, we call it a vertex. So the corner of an angle is called a vertex. And the way that we write an angle is we use the angle notation. So you write it as a little angle. And then you always put the vertex angle, the B in this case, in the middle. Meaning I could start at A, B, C, and that would draw my angle. You could also name it angle C, B, a, as long as the vertex angle is in the middle. So an angle, again, is made up of two rays. And again, I don't, you don't really need this definition column. Even if you drew an obtuse angle, so obtuse angle would look like this. And if I change this to a W, an X, a Y, and a Z, again, the corner is the vertex. And our notation is use the angle symbol. And I could call this angle W, X, Y. I could call this angle W, X, Z. Again, it doesn't matter which point I use on this side of the corner. And I could even reverse it. I could name it Y, X, W. Or I could name it, put it up here, Z, X, W. So the most important part is that vertex is the middle letter. So when we're discussing angles, when we start to read paragraphs with um, symbols in it, you'll now know that any time that you see a symbol like this, it looks like an angle. Now, some textbooks put little lines in here to also represent it as an angle and make sure that you're not confused as a less than sign. But most of the time, you just see it written as an angle. Um, again, mathematicians aren't very creative. So if you drew a circle, a circle always has a center, and um, we'll call it C. The notation for a circle is just a circle. Again, you have to put a dot in the middle, otherwise it looks like an O. And we would just call this circle C. So anytime that you see a circle with a dot in the middle, that represents the circle. The next vocabulary term on our list is perpendicular lines. Um, perpendicular lines that most people think of are corners of a room. Lines always have arrows at the ends of them. And if you're perpendicular, again, some people in our class remember this, perpendicular lines make right angles. So this is a right angle. And from your previous experience, you should know that all right angles are 90 degrees. So if you went around this, this would be a right angle, this would be a right angle, this would be a right angle. So all of these are 90 degree angles. Now when you talk about perpendicular lines, you have to give names to the lines. And one way to give names to lines is with cursive lowercase letters. So I could give the line going horizontal the name L. And I could give the line going vertical the name M. So if I was going to write this in a sentence, instead of writing out, again, I could write it out as line L is perpendicular to line M. And I said in class that I think mathematicians were probably the first people to really invent texting because they use symbols and shorthand notation to represent a whole bunch of different things. So our shorthand notation is, instead of writing out this whole sentence or phrase, L is perpendicular 
to M. So this symbol represents perpendicular, and sometimes they even put a little right corner in it so that you know that it means perpendicular. So in most cases, or in some cases, excuse me, they use cursive letters to represent names for lines. Um, parallel lines is one that you're familiar with. Parallel lines are lines, so lines again have arrows at the ends of them. They're parallel lines, and mathematicians aren't very good artists, so even though I have curvy lines, by putting an extra arrow in them, kind of in the middle, that represents or tells somebody these are parallel lines. And again, they use cursive letters, so let's call this one N, and we'll call this one P. So I could write line N is parallel, oops, parallel, to line P. But again, shorthand would be, let's say that line N is parallel to line P. So the two vertical lines represent vertical, or sorry, not, the two vertical parallel lines represent parallel. So we have some notations here. We have our angle notation, our circle notation. Perpendicular is probably the newest notation, but we did use that in our slope chapter. And parallel line notation you may have seen before. Again, mathematicians aren't very creative, so if you're talking about a line segment, a line has arrows, but a line segment has endpoints. And anytime we have a point, notice if you looked at our circle, it had a point in it and our angles had points in it, anytime that you have a point, they're labeled by a capital letter. So we'll call this point D and this point E. So that's a line segment. Again, mathematicians aren't creative, so they would say DE, because you're going from D to E, and they just put a little segment over the top. Just like your angle, as long as your endpoints are there, again, these are called endpoints, because they're at the end of your segment, you could re rewrite it as the other direction, because it's the exact same segment. E to D is the same thing as D to E. So that's a segment, and the notation is just a little segment over the top. An arc, so going back to our circle, so if we call this again center C, this is a circle, but an arc is just part of the outside or part of the circumference of the circle. These are points, so they get letters, so we'll call them F and G. Sometimes they even include a third one. We'll can call this one H. If you're going to name an arc, you have to put them in order. So if I would go from F to H to G, so that would represent going all the way around here. And then you just put an arc symbol over the top. Again, you can go in the opposite direction, G, H, F, but it has to go in order. So that's the arc symbol, an arc notation. Um, we've already mentioned the line. A line has arrows at the end of it. One way that you can name a line, again, is with a cursive letter. But you also have to know that a line is made up of an infinitely number of points. And they're all just packed together, and that's why it looks like a line. And so you can pull out a few points on the line, and we could call them, let's say, J, K, capital L, capital M. So this first one, we would call this line L. The second one over here, for notation purposes, if you wanted to do the entire line, you could call it J, M, and put a little line symbol over the top. You could also use J, K. That's still the same line, because if you went from J to K and it kept going, you'd get the same line. You could name it L, K. You could go backwards. The key point is the line symbol over the top of it. Notice that there's not one over the top of it when you use a cursive letter. And those are just two different notations that they kind of flip back and forth between. Um, we've already talked about a point. A point just looks like a dot, and it's always labeled with a capital letter. 
there's no when you're writing it in a sentence or when you read it in a word problem it will just write it out the word they'll say point p or they'll just talk about p um, or if it happens to be the letter q it would be called point if i can erase this point q or they would just say something about the letter q the last one is called a plane and the easiest way for me to describe a plane is it's not an airplane a plane is like a wall a wall that could go forever left and right and forever up and down it's not curvy it's completely straight and flat and it has no depth the way that they draw planes is they kind of draw them like this they sometimes look like rectangles or parallelograms but there's no let me erase that there's no depth to them it'd be like yeah a plane is like a wall that goes on forever and ever and I can't draw that on my paper so they just do this and then they just put points on the plane so if I put some points on here let's do R S T and when you name a plane unfortunately they don't really have a symbol for it so they actually use the word plane and you have to have at least three letters but it doesn't matter what order they are because they're not in any order on your paper so you can keep rearranging them in any order that you want the most important part though is the three points can't be in a straight line because then you would just have a line like up here a plane has to have three points that are not on a line so a plane is made of oops a plane is I thought it would come back made up of at least three points not on a line. So notice they're not on a the line. They kind of make a triangle. So those are the vocab terms that we are going to focus on for our first learning objective. So you need to be able to be able to write maybe a paragraph about them or read a word problem about them or just be able to name them if I give you a picture. So if you have any questions about the vocab, Feel free to stop this video, go back, rewind, look at it again, come back to it frequently throughout class. Um, the ones that I've noticed that people get stuck on in the past are the two that I have starred, the perpendicular lines and the parallel lines. They just kind of forget what those lines look like or what those lines tell us. Again, right angles, 90 degrees for perpendicular and parallel lines.